good afternoon everyone or good morning or good evening depending on where you are right now um it's a great pleasure for us to welcome you for the first session of the jurisprudence discussion group for a new year of legal philosophy in a slightly weird context hence the online format um but will not prevent us uh from enjoying great sessions and great presentations as well um the first of which should be the one from Gaston Singh uh, present today. Thank you so much, Professor, uh, for joining us. Before I turn to uh, introducing you, although you don't quite need it, uh, let me just uh, take a bit of time to introduce ourselves and most of all to explain how the session will unfold. Um, so Sebastian, Andreas and myself are three DPhil students in legal philosophy here in Oxford. Um, and we are also the governors of the jurisprudence discussion group for this year after the great work of our predecessors, Crescente, Josh, and Steini, who I think are also here today. Um, note that although I'm gonna be the chair for this session, Andreas uh, is a um, technical host, so please don't hesitate to reach him out if um, you need some technical assistance for any difficulty you may encounter. Uh, so now the session, we're gonna have a 30 minutes presentation approximately, followed by, by up to an hour uh, discussion uh, with Professor Sunstein. Please don't hesitate to send written questions uh, during the talk. However, please don't publish them in the public chat, uh, but rather only to me. So it's quite easy to do. Uh, when you click on the chats uh, label down your screen, you can select to whom you send your question. It can be to everybody or only to one of the numerous names that appear in the list. So please select Silo Giovanni and only send question to me so that to avoid distracting uh, the whole audience during the talk. Just um, start a question with a cue so that I can know it's a question directed to the speaker and introduce very roughly the topic of your question so that during the Q&A we may gather bundles of questions on related topics. Um, I think that's all for the practicalities. Let me know if it's unclear again uh, in the chat. And now we can turn to the essential part uh, of the meeting. So thank you so much again, Professor Sunstein, for uh, coming with us today. Um, no use, I think, to introduce a great lawyer and legal philosopher that all students on this session, and we hope we are many, uh, have had the opportunity to, to hear or uh, read during their scholarship. So it's a great privilege to be able now to have you live. Um, you're here to talk about the Fifty Shades of Manipulation, and please, you have the floor. Thank you so much. It's uh, an honor to get to talk to you all. I wish I could be there in person, but this is uh, pretty close, and increasingly as we use the technology, it's kind of the same. And uh, this is a topic that has a tiger by the tail, uh, the topic of manipulation. Uh, in philosophy, there's some excellent work in jurisprudence connecting this with uh, legal and regulatory problems. We're really uh, uh, just starting, I think. And uh, this is an effort to slow the tiger down before it runs away, at least with the author. Uh, so for orientation, here are some uh, examples of arguable or uh, transparently manipulative actions. Um, I'm not sure how many of you know the old show Mad Men, which is brilliant on the topic of manipulation. Our hero, Don Draper, in one of the episodes is talking to cigarette company executives who are trying to market a product that is thought to be poisonous in the early days. And they work for an old cigarette company called Lucky Strike, and Lucky Strike is very concerned that everyone is going to stop smoking their cigarettes because they are poisonous. And Don Draper, our hero, asked the executives, how do you make these cigarettes? And the executives say, well, we take them in the ground, we apply various things to them, we then mold them in various ways, we then toast them, and he, he halts, halts the executive and said, you toast them. And then he writes on a blackboard, lucky strike, it's toasted. And then the executives say there are six main cigarette companies and they all toast their product. This is not unique to us. And Don Draper responds, um, no, their products are poisonous. 
lucky strike, it's toasted. And that becomes an advertising campaign. I don't know if it's a real advertising campaign, but it mimics reality. So think of Lucky Strike, it's toasted as a case study in, I think, unarguable manipulation. Um, in many countries, most recently the United States, uh, cigarette packages must by law be accompanied by a graphic warning, which contains not just words, but a picture of someone who's really sick. And in many of these labels, um, uh, watching them, seeing them is extremely alarming. You're seeing someone who looks like they're dying or in acute distress. That's arguably manipulative. All over Germany, partly under the um, pressure of uh, um, Chancellor Merkel's uh, efforts to combat climate change and partly under the influence of behavioral findings, uh, consumers are automatically enrolled in more expensive green energy. Uh, they are given the option of opting out and going to coal. The data is highly suggestive that all over the country, automatic enrollment in green energy is extremely effective in, uh, in promoting green energy use. Is that manipulative? Uh, if so, what's wrong with it? Uh, that's my third example. The fourth is connected with the anti-obesity efforts in the UK right now, where uh, it is said that private and public institutions are fastening on grocery store design as a, uh, an instrument for promoting healthier choices, where the basic idea if grocery stores either voluntarily or through some agreement with officials or maybe through a mandate from officials uh, do a self-consciously uh, redesign to promote not what consumers would choose, to be their design, uh, but what would promote consumers to make healthier choices. So this is a design which is not consumers kind of meta design. It's instead a design by uh, public health officials that is steering people in directions that are better for combating obesity. Is that manipulative? Okay, that's just for orientation. I'm going to go at the problem in a, a, a somewhat unintuitive way. I'm going to begin by exploring what's wrong with manipulation and then work on uh, the definition of manipulation rather than vice versa, and then encounter some hard cases. So the strategy is to get a handle on what makes manipulation a bad thing then to get a handle on what manipulation is, and then to explore testing cases. Okay, I'm going to venture now a unified view of coercion, lies, and manipulation, and suggest that our candidate theories for moral evaluation are the same, and they cut uh, clarifyingly across these three categories which are analytically the same, whether we are Kantians or utilitarians. So the hypothesis is that coercion, lies, and manipulation actually suffer from the same moral wrong, uh, which would be different depending on whether we're Kantian or utilitarians, but it would be the same given an ethical foundation. So on Kantian grounds, what makes all three wrong is that they treat people as means, not as ends, and they don't respect people's agency. So Christine Korsgaard has an essay on lying, which says that analytically a lie is wrong for the exact same reason that coercion is wrong, that people's autonomy is violated. They are treated as means and not ends. Manipulation does exactly the same thing. It bypasses people's capacity for reflective judgment and turns them uh, in a direction 
that let's say the manipulator thinks best rather than allowing the agent to make his or her own choice about what's best. So on that view, an act of manipulation is like an act of theft, which is the same thing that coercion is and the same thing that a lie is. So the basic Kantian rejection of manipulation fits well with Kant's own uh, pretty categorical uh, rejection of lying, and it fits also with the Kantian opposition to coercion uh, if the design of coercion is to promote the, uh, the goals of the coercer. Okay, the utilitarian objection to manipulation is more interesting, I think. And it's rooted in Mill's harms principle. Not that it's better, I also think it's better, but let's bracket that, it's more interesting. So Mill urges that in defense of his harm principle that the justification is epistemic. It's not about dignity or autonomy. And Mill's account in On Liberty is, is kind of remarkably um, uh, bereft of anything about dignity or respect for agency. The basic idea is that the outsider doesn't know what the actor knows and that the actor, even if less informed than the outsider with respect to general things, doesn't know what the individual knows about particular things. Um, I think it's a plausible speculation to think that Mill's um, account of the harm principle and the epistemic disadvantage of the outsider was informed by his personal life and his romance with Harriet Taylor. But bracketing that, the claim is that an individual, whether a consumer or an investor or an experimenter in living, knows a lot about his or her personal situation, and an outsider just isn't going to know that which is to suggest that the outsider is going to leave the individual less well off because the individual is making choices that are uh, more informed than the outsider. Now, Mill's argument, of course, was about coercion. It goes through perfectly with respect to at least relevant lies if an outsider, whether it's someone in the government or whether it's a friend or an employer or a lawyer or a doctor is lying to get someone to do something, you're bypassing the fact that the individual is by stipulation in a better position to make a choice than you are and the, the liar is not giving the person with their epistemic advantages a chance at applying their own reflective capacities to the problem with information. So if the question is in the context of a lie, what kind of investment to make, what kind of medical choice to make, the liar is uh, running afoul of the foundations of the harm principle, though not technically running afoul of the harm principle. Okay, the manipulator has exactly the same problem. That is, the manipulator is not allowing the chooser to make a choice based on a non-manipulative, let's say, presentation of the facts. You could imagine a cigarette smoker learning that Lucky Strike is toasted, but also learning that every cigarette is toasted and uh, learning what it means to be toasted and making decisions that are free from that kind of undermining that comes from the manipulation. I bracketed uh, the definitional question. We're going to get to that in a moment. Uh, but that's the basic, uh, the basic account on utilitarian grounds of why the liar, the coercer, and the manipulator are kind of three evil figures on utilitarian grounds because they are not allowing the chooser with his or her understanding of the context and relevant values and tastes to make a choice free from those things. 
Okay, I think that the uh, the utilitarian here, and it can be, you know, a welfareist of a relatively non-sectarian sort rather than a narrow uh, utilitarian who thinks of pleasures and pains, uh, has to acknowledge that the arguments against coercion and lying and manipulation are contingent rather than categorical, and that the epistemic uh, account that Mill offers is more fragile now than it was when he was writing, because there are reasons why the chooser might be making terrible blunders, notwithstanding her his epistemic advantages. So if a chooser is buying, let's say, a full calorie, full sugar soft drink, or a car that lacks good fuel economy, it may be that the chooser is showing limited attention and not looking at the full category of characteristics that actually matter to welfare. That would be a reason why fuel economy might be insufficiently attended to. It might be that the chooser would show present bias and focus on the short-term economic, let's say, and recreational benefits of the car and not the five-year economic benefits of fuel economy. It might be that the chooser would suffer from unrealistic optimism, which would make the chooser of, let's say, an unhealthy drink insufficiently attentive to the actual risks of diabetes, et cetera, that come from obesity. So the behavioral findings unsettle Mill's epistemic justification for the harm principle. And at the same time, and this is more jarring, I think, unsettle the utilitarian objections to lying and to manipulation. Now, Korsgaard has something to say at this point, which is that the fact that the utilitarian objection has this degree of fragility with respect to lying is a point against utilitarianism, that it doesn't count for our considered judgments about what's wrong with lying. The same may be true of manipulation. I disagree with Korsgaard and think that the fact that our intuitions work hard to resist the behavioral objections to the welfarist uh, complaint about lying, manipulation, and coercion is a point against the intuitions. I confess that my own intuitions rebel really hard against the claim that lying can be justified in situations where the object of the lie is made much better off by the lie. That, but I think that is a, uh, a, a squeaky voice in the head, which is good that people have, uh, because it serves some good rural utilitarian interests. Nonetheless, the Kantian intuitions are a moral heuristic and not the right foundation for thinking about these topics. So I realize that's a somewhat uh, uh, reckless and certainly very brief uh, plea for the priority of welfareism to Kantianism. Uh, that may be entirely wrong. The more important point is to see the track along which the Kantian complaint about manipulation, lying, and coercion is the same, and the utilitarian complaint about those three things is also the same, uh, and one has to do with epistemic advantages on the part of choosers, that's the utilitarian, the other has to do with treating people as agents and ends, that's the Kantian. Okay, now let's talk a bit, and I apologize that I'm not satisfied with where I've gotten, but a, a bit about what manipulation is. So people who are interested in law and legal theory, I think have a nice path to take because what the legal system calls up is a lot of practices that are arguably manipulative but legal actors lack a definition of manipulation that is usable. And that is a significant gap, both in theory and in practice, in an era in which the categories of, let's say, deception and fraud, though reasonably well understood, don't capture an assortment of practices that are creating a lot of concern and angst these days. 
where you might have dark patterns on the web, for example, in which people are uh, people's, let's say, uh, present bias or limited attention or unrealistic optimism is exploited by self-interested actors and it can't, without a lot of stretching, be called deception or fraud, it's manipulation. Um, and the legal system probably ought to do something about that, or at least there's an argument that it should. To do something about that, we need a category. And the category both has to be uh, fair to the concept and also usable. And that's a neat trick. Okay, the philosophical literature on manipulation, I'm gonna be a little truncated here, uh, shows um, heterogeneity in the preferred definition, but there's something like agreement that manipulation consists of subverting people's capacity for reflection and, and deliberation so that people aren't given a fair chance to reflect deliberatively on the problem such that there's something in their head that's been subverted. That definitional attempt, it's not a definition yet, uh, fits nicely with the Kantian and Millian accounts of what's wrong with it. So to give a reasonably anodyne example from the philosophical literature, if a nurse flirts with an elderly patient to get him to take his medicine, that isn't a gross evil, but that is uh, a form of manipulation in ordinary language. His capacity to decide whether to take the medicine has not been uh, engaged by the fact that she's uh, flirted with him. Okay, what the psychological um, kind of specification of the philosophical work would suggest is that uh, Crudely speaking, there's an automatic intuitive system in the human mind, which actually has neurological uh, analogs, which is rapid and, uh, and quick. And then there's a more deliberative and cognitive aspect of the human mind, which is slower and more reflective. You can think of the prefrontal cortex as the second and the amygdala as the first. That's very rough, but maybe uh, uh, close enough for, for now. Um, and the idea might be, if we combine the philosophical work with the psychological claim, that the manipulative stuff goes at system one hard and doesn't attend to system two, and the non-manipulative is an engagement of the deliberative capacity. So I tell you a little story to make this more intuitive? Um, I have a son who's 11 years old, and when he was eight, he was not able to resist a toy store whenever we passed it. And toy stores are often designed so as to subvert people's deliberative capacity as they pass by. And in order to overcome his um, self-conscious uh, agitation, at the existence of toy stores by which we passed, as any good father would, I explained to him the difference between system one and system two. Is he gonna be in therapy, do you think now? Is this like uh, a terrible thing for a father to do? But I did explain the difference between system one and system two. And it worked for a few weeks until he said to me one morning, thinking, you know, in a very engaged way about toy stores. He said, Daddy, do I even have a system too? I wasn't quick enough to be able to say, you didn't, uh, you must, otherwise you wouldn't have answered, asked that question. Only system two could ask that question. So we might be tempted to combine the work on subversion of deliberative capacities with the psychological stuff and gin up uh, an account, a psychologically uh, informed account of what manipulation is. And that would fit pretty well with uh, the account of what's wrong with manipulation. Okay, there are two problems with this, I think, which is why I'm dissatisfied 
keenly with where I now am. And let me give them in sequence and then try to come to terms with the dissatisfaction. Hey, lots of things engage system one in one way or another, and they're not properly characterized as manipulative. If a lion is chasing you and your friend says, run, that would not be properly characterized as manipulative, even though system one and the amygdala are engaged. If there are traffic lights for food, green, yellow, and red, let's just say that green induces positive affect, which is not keenly deliberative, it's not free from deliberation, but it's not you know, a calculation. And red is like a, you know, stop, halt. And it, let's just stipulate what I think is true, that that uh, has a, uh, that's not as deliberative as a calorie label would be. Is that, uh, is that manipulative in the ordinary language sense? That's not entirely clear. If a doctor is trying to build patient morale by saying with a big smile, this could really work, or doing things that are a little more in that direction than the words I just uttered, but that are in, designed to get the patient system one or non-deliberative capacities uh, really engaged, would we describe that as manipulative? Not at all clear. Okay, let's just say that to go hard at the deliberative capacity, non-deliberative uh, distinction, as some of the philosophical work does, runs afoul of the fact that that defies intuitive understandings of what manipulation is, where we, don't, we aren't so stringent and severe as to describe some of these things like what I've discussed as um, manipulative. Okay, Anne Barnhill, philosopher who's done what I believe to be the very best work, the finest work on definition of manipulation, says, uh, gets that point completely. And she says, what we have to do is not talk about, you know, subverting deliberative capacities or not, but instead talk about ideals for choice making and say that something is manipulative that uh, violates ideals that appeals to people in a way that uh, violates ideals for choice making. Now, whose ideals is a fair question? I think it's the objectively correct ideals. And that's, that's, that's progress. I think that's as good as we've got. I have an alternative, which is uh, more self-consciously vague which says uh, manipulation is something that insufficiently engages deliberative capacities. And the vagueness of insufficiently is admittedly a problem. So uh, things are invite it is invited to do better than Barnhill or yours truly has done. I think in the end, her uh, violates ideals notion has the same problems as my is insufficiently definition does, but the word insufficiently has the advantage of complete transparency about how we need to have a conversation about what sufficient engagement of deliberative capacities is. Okay, so I said there's one problem with the philosophical account, which is lots of things do not fully appeal to liber deliberative capacities and aren't fairly characterized as manipulative. I promised you there's a second problem, and here's the second problem. There are a lot of decisions which are properly non-deliberative, and we wouldn't describe those who help people to make those decisions, let's say, as manipulating them. So if there is an effort to get people to enjoy a delicious meal, where that enjoyment and the choice of it isn't deliberative, it's more delighted, let's say, to appeal to people's capacity for delight in food is not to manipulate them necessarily. Um, I'm thinking there's something that's between fraud and the non-deliberative appeal that would count as manipulative, but there are non-deliberative appeals to, let's say, uh, the most amazing meal there is at, in Oxford, 
which would not be fair to call uh, non-deliberative. Uh, if someone is falling in love and things are inducing that on the part of, let's say, the beloved to say that's not sufficiently deliberative, the person's being manipulated is kind of crazy, though there are ways of manipulating people to fall in love. The only point is that there are th a series of human decisions which are non-deliberative and that's fine. And we have to think hard, I think, about what in that space would make the appeal manipulative. It wouldn't be that it's non-deliberative. It might have something to do with it's not satisfying the appropriate standards for non-deliberative choice, something like that. Okay, so where we are now is we have uh, provisional accounts of two different kinds for what's wrong with manipulation. We have gestures toward maybe a little more than that toward a definition of manipulation where one account is failing to uh, uh, obey suitable standards for choice making or set, work with ideals. The other is insufficiently uh, deliberative decision making. And now we have testing cases. I'm going to give two cases that I think are easy and then two that are, uh, are harder. Um, suppose, um, well, I'll give you a story from a friend, shall I, about a medical choice? Uh, this is real. I, I also have a stylized one that's a little simpler, but let's go give the real one. A friend of mine was recently advised by a doctor to take a medication for a very minor heart issue. And what the doctor said is you should do this because if you do this, you will cut your stroke risk uh, by about a third. That's good, do it. And I think the doctor was being sincere, but whether or not the doctor was being sincere, as the friend explained the situation to me, the numbers were much more uh, caution inducing than that accurate statement, you'll cut your stroke risk by a third. And he, here's what the numbers look like. My friend's stroke risk was approximately 1.3 for 1.3% uh, uh, for the next year. And if she took the medicine, her stroke risk would be 1% for the next year. That's cutting it by approximately a third, but that's ridiculously trivial cutting of the stroke risk. So three in a thousand people would get a stroke if they didn't take the medicine, who would not get a stroke if they took the medicine. To refer to your cutting your stroke risk by a third is to manipulate, I say, because it is inducing an insufficiently deliberative reaction to the choice to be made. This is a long-winded way of saying that to speak of risk reduction in terms of relative risk is frequently to manipulate people. If people are told you can cut your risk in half by having a certain test, where you can cut your risk from, from one in 100,000, let's say, to one in 200,000, to say you're cutting your risk by one in 100,000 to one in 200,000 is not manipulative. To say you can cut your risk in half is manipulative because it's inducing a non-deliberative out of that, which is insufficiently reflective or not living up to proper ideals for deliberation. So relative risk talk of the sort that is common, public officials and doctors, I say runs afoul of the uh, objection to manipulation. By contrast, calorie labels or nutrition fact panels, we can call them educative, are plainly non-manipulative. They are simply efforts to inform choice and to increase personal agency. So any concerns we have about things in this general domain, are uh, eliminated in the case of uh, numbers. Numbers that are not misleading, like the relative risk numbers. 
two easy cases. Uh, uh, one hard case involved graphic warnings. And the reason this is a hard case is that whether a graphic warning compromises ideals for choice making or may or insufficiently deliberative judgment is actually really complicated. And the complication is both empirical and normative. Part of the empirical complication is there's data suggesting that after people get, get graphic warnings, they end up thinking more soundly about the risks that they're actually subject to. So they see the terrible pictures, then they're asked what are the risks in numerical form, and they get give better answers. So graphic warnings appear to promote accurate judgments about risk levels. But you got that promotion a little bit sideways or through the back door by making people get scared. So it's unclear whether we should say about graphic warnings that they don't count as manipulative given that they promote accuracy of judgment or that they sufficiently appeal to people's deliberative capacities, though they don't only do that, or we should say that they're manipulative, but they are nonetheless justified because of their welfare effects. So that, that's a hard one for, for me. Uh, default rules can also be a hard one. Remember people in Germany are automatically enrolled in green energy. Uh, I bet everyone on this call is automatically enrolled in at least two things. And I bet some of you are automatically enrolled in something that you don't know you're automatically enrolled in. Everyone in the UK, by the way, as of recently, is automatically an organ donor. That's a switch in the law. So unless you opt out, you're automatically an organ donor. Don't get scared. That doesn't mean someone's going to come and steal your organs. It means if you have no longer use for them because something terrible has happened, you are presumed to have consented to their use by someone who can use them and needs them to live. Okay, is that manipulative? The, uh, it, that's not clear, is it? Uh, as a first approximation, if people are told you are automatically enrolled in green energy or you're automatically in a savings plan or an energy plan, do you want to opt out? There's nothing manipulative about that. But if there is exploitation of, let's say, inertia or limited attention, such that people aren't given clarity and, made, and it's not made salient to them that they are automatically enrolled in something, then we can say that their capacity for deliberation hasn't been sufficiently respected or that ideals for deliberative choice haven't been lived up to because the behavioral, let's call it bias, that is limited attention or that is um, unrealistic optimism or something uh, has kicked in and made people not made an informed judgment about X or Y or Z. Okay, I'm, I'm almost done. Uh, one obvious question is whether consent to being manipulated eliminates the moral concern. So let's say that people say ex ante in a deliberative uh, place that I welcome it, manipulate me with respect to something involving my own impulsiveness or something involving my health or safety, uh, do that. Uh, on Kantian grounds, it's not obvious whether we should uh, accept that. And I think the arguments both ways are pretty clear. Um, there might be an inalienability to the respect for agency idea. On utilitarian grounds, it ought to be okay, at least as a general rule, that the chooser is saying, I know about my own, let's say, um, uh, deliberative failings, and I know about my own uh, recklessness. Uh, uh, from the standpoint of my own welfare, I want you to manipulate me. It's probably, probably okay. Okay, I think we now have, as a result of this, a two by two matrix where we might say that 
um, the clearly um, unacceptable things are highly manipulative. So in the two by two matrix, we have benign and informed people uh, at the top left, then malign or uninformed people at the top right. And then we have not highly manipulative on the left and highly manipulative below it. And if we have a not highly manipulative person who is benign and informed, then it's acceptable on welfare grounds, and it might be acceptable by reference to autonomy or dignity. If we have a highly manipulative and malign or uninformed person, then it's highly unacceptable, both on welfare and uh, Kantian grounds. If we have a highly manipulative person who is benign and informed, the welfareist might nod with a Kantian uh, tingle down the spine and the Kantian would object. Okay, uh, the big game here, you may have detected, is that uh, I'm pondering the creation of a right not to be manipulated. So famously, uh, Brandeis and Warren argued in the early part of the 20th century for a right to privacy. Uh, someone ought to argue in the early part of the 21st century for the right not to be manipulated. And in many ways, it's precisely parallel in terms of circumstances compared to concept to where Brandeis and Warren were with privacy. Uh, given dark patterns online, things that are happening on Facebook and YouTube and Twitter, uh, there's a great deal that is disrespecting people's agency and reducing their welfare that isn't adequately captured by notions like fraud and deception. Dark patterns online are an egregious case in point. If there is going to be a right to be manipulated, it should apply to government action as well, and the definition should be parallel to the definition applied to commercial actors. Uh, cards finally on the table. Uh, I would bite the welfareist bullet and adopt uh, a mill-like position on these issues uh, with the behavioral qualification that um, certain forms of manipulation are in the end justified on welfareist grounds. But it would probably be right to say for rule consequentialist reasons, we might want to admit that to the uh, world of civilized people, only very rarely. Thank you, floor is open. Thank you very much, President Steen, for this very interesting presentation. Um, just some precisions for the Q&A, so please uh, keep sending your questions to me uh, on the chat. We already